A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers, God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts that we in turn might make known the glory of God shining on the face of Christ. This treasure we possess in earthen vessels to make it clear that its surpassing power comes from God and not from us. We are afflicted in every way possible, but we are not crushed. Full of doubts, we never despair. We are persecuted, but never abandoned. We are struck down, but never destroyed. Continually, we carry about in our bodies the dying of Jesus, so that in our bodies the life of Jesus may also be revealed. While we live, we are constantly being delivered to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our mortal flesh. We do not lose heart because our inner being is renewed each day, even though our body is being destroyed at the same time. The present burden of our trial is light enough and earns for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. The word of the Lord.
Dominus Vobiscum. Et cum Spiritum Tua. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matteum. Jesus said to his disciples, If a man wishes to come after me, he must deny his very self, take up his cross, and begin to follow in my footsteps. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit would a man show if he were to gain the whole world and destroy himself in the process? What can a man offer in exchange for his very self? The Son of Man will come with his Father's glory, accompanied by his angels. When he does, he will repay each man according to his conduct. Verbum Domini. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Those are our marching orders. That's the speech we get as we go into battle in this life, right? To take up our cross. Why? Because that's how Jesus saved the world. Through the cross, not through, not through the great things of the world, not by gaining the whole world, not by worldly, earthly empires, He's crucified outside the city walls on a hill abandoned by his disciples except for John, Our Lady, and some of the holy women. And that's our salvation because he rises three days later. So we, as Christians, are called to participate in this. And the saints witness to this in the most extraordinary way, especially the saint today, Saint Veronica, Giuliani, she is a Fort Clare Capuchin nun. She was born in 1660 in Mercatello, Italy, died in 1716. Uh, she was the abbess of the monastery <clears throat> for about 15 years or so, 16 years. But she had these extraordinary experiences throughout her life, conversations with Christ and just all kinds of mystical phenomena. And she wrote prolifically letters, autobiographical reports, poems. She wrote a 22,000 page diary that covered her 34 years of cloistered life. And on literally every page of this diary, she would commend someone to the Lord, reinforcing her prayers of intercession and her suffering. Her life was completely characterized with this anxiety for the desire for the salvation of the whole world. She would write, O oh sinners, all men, all women, come to Jesus' heart, come to be cleansed by his most precious blood. He awaits you with open arms to embrace you. She summed up her contemplative mission with these words, <clears throat> We cannot go about the world preaching to convert souls, but we are bound to pray ceaselessly for all those souls who are offending God, particularly with our sufferings. That is with a principle of, cru with a principle of crucified life. Our saint conceived this mission as being in the midst of men and God, of sinners and the crucified one. So very much she felt this communion of the church, this communion with sinners, you know, praying, offering her life up for others. And she would say, to suffer with joy is the key to love. To suffer with joy is the key to love. Love grows in sacrifice, <clears throat> to be able to rise above it, to keep our eyes on the Lord, to have some joy in that, in a sense which is hard to do, I think, <laughs> oftentimes. 
But we have glimpses of that, don't we? We have, we have experiences of God's presence in difficult moments. If we can kind of get out of ourselves and keep our eyes focused on the Lord, we can have something of his joy. And she got to the point where she actually asked Jesus to be crucified with him. And she received the stigmata in the most extraordinary way. You can read about it. <clears throat> it's quite spectacular. <laughs> to me, she's like the, what you think of in the lives of the saints uh, and all the hagiography. She experienced all these phenomena. You know, that's just incredible to imagine. She said, all the saints are up there thanks to the merit of the passion of Jesus, but they cooperated with all that the Lord did so that their life was totally ordered, regulated by these same works. She had to battle the devil. She was taken to hell a, a number of times. And her favorite scripture passage was, if God is for us, who is against us? I thought that spoke of her struggle and she was, you know, for a number of years, the superior of the community, you know, having to have her feet on the ground and make practical decisions, you know, living in the quote unquote real demands of the world, but never lost sight of our Lord. As I mentioned, she had many mystical phenomena, conversations with heaven. She was close to Our Lady, would have apparitions with her. And she continually, throughout her life, you see, she developed her union with Christ. She witnessed to that. She was a consecrated, cloistered nun. She had this concrete witness to the spousal union that we, as church, as bride to Christ, are to have with our Lord. We are to abandon ourselves. This goes for all of us, with complete trust to God and union with the church, with solidarity with the church. She participated in the suffering love of Jesus Christ crucified and was caught up in that love for humanity, for sinners. And she would meditate on the scriptures. She would quote the scriptures in the huge diary she wrote. Her last words were, I have found love. Love has let himself be seen. In some ways, you can imagine a person without faith and reading these things would say, what a horrible life right? to be suffering, to have the stigmata and everything. She writes through all this, I found love, you know, through the cross. So we have that same path before us. St. Paul writes today in 2 Corinthians, <clears throat> Let light shine out of darkness. He's shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the transcendental, transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. Let light shine out of darkness. That that light that shines from the Christian is a reflected light from Christ shining in our hearts. Through our knowledge and love of him, we participate in the divine nature, and it can shine out so that we can be salt and light in the world. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, earthenware jars, crack pots, as Mother would say, <laughs> Mother Angelica. That there's a brokenness in our humanity, as a brokenness to the world, and that's all part of the cross. Our struggles with our own issues, our own problems. You know, this is, that cross, as I mentioned, is the heart of Christianity. That's where salvation, that's where holiness, sanctification, the salvation of the world takes place. And we have that when we're born into this broken world, just automatically. We have a fallen humanity. Some of us, just seem to be hell-bent on self-destruction, have very messy lives, born in difficult situations. I heard a beautiful reflection recently by one of the, uh, the friars of the renewal, the CFR priest, and he talked about how, you know, some people's lives 
look like such a mess. You know, by worldly standards, like from the outside, looks like such a mess. But God, and, and he said, you know, that they oftentimes have grown up in very difficult things. They're doing the best they can, trying to get along. And he said, God sees that, right? And he, we look at it and say it's a mess. God looks at it and he's on his feet cheering because he sees the person making progress, cooperating with grace, making an effort, that they had maybe much more to overcome than other people did. God's on his feet cheering. This treasure we have in earthen vessels. So we don't lose heart. The outer man's passing away, our inner man's being renewed every day for this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. What if a man were to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? What can we give in return for this life that we've been given, this Christian life, this treasure, this sharing in the divine nature, this relationship that's offered, offered to us? to trade it for the false idols of the world, to chase after just the great things of the world. <coughs> yes, we want to you know, live our family life and have jobs and we need things for that. And, but that's, that's not the goal, is the stuff and the activities. We do all that in union with our Lord to offer it up to him. It may be an you know, expression of, of God's glory in our lives when we, when we work and we have, you know, we have the charge to cultivate and till the earth, to develop it, but keeping our eyes on the Lord. And we know that aspect of toil that's entered into our existence now, but that cross has a resurrection on the other side of it. That's what I think St. Paul and the gospel is telling us today, you know, to give up on ourselves, having in our way, you know, to come to the end of ourself, kind of, it's not about me. This life is not about me. To offer that to the Lord, the resurrection is experienced <clears throat> on the other side of that, that death and that suffering. <clears throat> and it's for all eternity, this world's passing. The saints witness to this and their extraordinary life, generous life, you know, the joy that they have encourages us all.